Right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, the uh, Sims Online Lecture. Uh, my name is Dr. Nicholas Herman. I'm Curator of Manuscripts here at the Schoenberg Institute for Manuscript Studies at the University of Pennsylvania, and it's a pleasure uh, to welcome uh, Judith uh, Olshowi Schlanger, who will be speaking to us today. Um, shortly, uh, I just wanted to say a few words of introduction about uh, the Schoenberg Institute before we begin. Uh, the Schoenberg Institute for Manuscript Studies is a think tank for uh, the study of manuscripts in the digital age uh, across the globe, really, and um, we uh, produce numerous programs such as this online lecture series. We also have an annual symposium in November coming up. Uh, which is entitled this year is entitled Translating Science. That is on November from November 10th to November 12th, both uh, in person here in Philadelphia and uh, also uh, online. So uh, we encourage you to, to uh, attend that as well. That's November 10th to 12th, and there will be details posted in the chat. And the conference will consider uh, the networks of exchange, transmission, and translation of natural knowledge in manuscript cultures of the uh, pre- and early modern periods. Uh, we also have uh, uh, another online lecture scheduled for uh, December, uh, December 9th with Federico Botana, who will be speaking uh, to us about the card index of Leo Olschke and the trade in medieval manuscripts in the early 20th century. So uh, some very uh, diverse programming coming up. I'll also make a quick mention of uh, the Schoenberg Institute's journal, Manuscript Studies. The latest issue has just appeared, uh, uh, Volume 7, Issue 2, Fall 2022 issue. And, uh, of course, we know uh, Professor Olshawi Schlanger's work very well, but also we know her well at the Schoenberg Institute through her uh, participation on the advisory board, editorial board for the journal. Uh, and thank her for participating and for uh, also soliciting some wonderful recent articles on Hebrew manuscripts uh, that we've published in Manuscript Studies. So keep an eye out for Manuscript Studies, which is available uh, online uh, via Project Muse. It's available in print, uh, and it's also available with a one-year moving wall on Scholarly Commons, uh, which is our institutional repository. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Olshoi Schlanger, uh, whose work uh, I think is, is known to many of you. She is, uh, since 2002, she's been chair of Hebrew and Judeo-Arabic studies at the École Pratique des Hautes Études in Paris. And since 2018, uh, she has been a professor of Hebrew uh, and Jewish studies at Oxford University and a fellow of Corpus Christi College. And she's also president of the Oxford Center for Hebrew and Jewish Studies. Uh, and a uh, fellow of the British Academy. Her research uh, is very wide-ranging and considers uh, the multifarious role of uh, the Hebrew text and Hebrew script in uh, many parts of, of the medieval world, very broadly writ, and uh, her publications are very numerous. I'll mention, mention some recent uh, contributions to important uh, collected uh, essay volumes, the European book in the 12th century, the Cambridge history of Judaism, uh, and the Hebrew Bible, a millennium. So contributions to those important volumes, as well uh, as monographs, uh, Hebrew and Hebrew Latin documents from medieval England uh, from uh, 2015, and books within books, new discoveries in old book bindings, which is a project she's been very involved in and 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 for, for several years now. Um, today she will be speaking to us uh, about uh, digital tools for Hebrew paleography and we look forward to learning about this exciting project uh, from uh, from Professor Olshawi Schlanger. So Judith, thank you. Thank you Nicolas. Thank you Lynn for inviting me to speak today at uh, Penn Libraries. I was, uh, I spent very happy two weeks in a different life before COVID in the library, in, in the wonderful collection uh, of pen libraries. Um, the Hebrew manuscripts are maybe not as many as in Oxford or in Paris, but they are very interesting and I was really happy to be there. And when I, when I worked in uh, Philadelphia with you, I started to think about the methodology of the teaching of Hebrew paleography. 
uh, we discussed it a lot with Lynn, Ben, and um, it was extremely important for me that after many years of teaching Hebrew manuscripts and Hebrew paleography, it is time now to begin to, to, to try to find a methodology which does not only help to identify the manuscripts, but also to communicate the discoveries and the knowledge of paleographers, a very specialist knowledge, which is, which is in fact limited to very few people as far as Hebrew paleography is concerned. So my concern in the recent years was to communicate what I was able in my modest way to acquire through 20, more than 20 years of teaching, of teaching Hebrew paleography, because some of, uh, of my activities concern teaching to students, to graduate students, and I try to communicate some features of the script which can help to um, create a typology and to identify the script in such a way that the paleography, the identification of the script, helps to situate a manuscript in history, in a historical background, in time and space. So one, one thing is to know about the manuscript. You look at the manuscript and say, wow, that's great. It is a 13th century French manuscript. And another way is to explain why and to, to transfer your own expertise uh, in such a way that uh, other people can reproduce it and, uh, and follow a very specific method and a way of thinking about the manuscript, which will help them first to acquire a certain expertise and then to, to be able really to work with the manuscripts. So today I'd like to talk to you about a method that, uh, that I have elaborated not alone, with many scholars, with many colleagues and students participating in the project. It is a new method. It is a digital method. Uh, we don't have, for the time being, a method or a guidebook or a handbook um, of Hebrew paleography as such. We have wonderful scholars who worked on Hebrew manuscripts, who published some articles on specific aspects of manuscripts, but for the time being, even from the traditional point of view, we do not have a guidebook to Hebrew paleography. We have several um, preliminary works, but not a final guidebook, which will allow scholars, students to be helped towards their study, uh, personal study of the manuscript. We don't have a book, a handbook, a proper book on this subject. Um, however, we are already trying to move to the digital age. And instead of just publishing a book on a Hebrew uh, paleography, a handbook for Hebrew paleography, we are moving directly on a different medium, which is the computer medium, and which can be extremely helpful for our project. What I'm going to talk today, it's a digital project. It is not a computerized artificial intelligence project. A lot of judgment and work which goes into creating the Hebrew paleography album I'm going to talk about, which is not yet, which is not yet finished by far, it's just the beginning of the way, uh, is uh, manual. It's done by scholars behind the screen of the computer. Um, this project, and I'm going to explain it to you, connects as well with another project which is a computational paleography project where the knowledge which comes from the human description of the manuscripts online in our digital paleography album will be used to, to teach the computers to create networks and algorithms which will allow the computers to try to identify, paleographically speaking, the script of the Hebrew manuscripts. So this is, this is, so what I'm going to present today, it's still, humans are still behind. It is a digital program. And in order to do it, I will share my screen. I'm sorry, please bear with me. Mm -hmm. 
share the screen. Here it is. Here you are. Can you see my screen? So when we talk about the paleography and paleographical methods, and before I move on to the digital methods, we need to ask the old question that all, all of those who work on Hebrew manuscripts and are trained or try to be trained in Hebrew manu manuscripts and especially paleography need to ask uh, whether paleography is a science that means whether we can talk about the specific methodology for the study of the Hebrew script as opposed to to the other elements of the manuscripts, such as parchment, uh, composition of the choirs, page layout, which can be quantified, which can be measured. It is much more difficult as far as paleography is concerned. There is a very strong subjective aspect and the, the, the element of expertise, which is acquired through years. So is the paleography a science or is it an art? And here, the the jury is out, we still don't, we are not very clear about it. So we have very important Latin paleographer, Montague Rhodes James, who is often quoted in this, um, in this matter, who at some point after having written many, manus many catalogs of Latin manuscripts in British libraries, uh, says very clearly, I cannot teach the art of assigning the dates to manuscripts. I am even inclined to think that it cannot be taught. He's rather thinking about, about, the, about the forming of the way of looking at the manuscripts, the study of facsimiles to begin with, and later on the constant handling of the books themselves. These supply the only safe guidance to the condition of the eye and mind, which will enable the student to say unhesitantly, this is a 12th century book and this is a 15th, this was written in Italy and this in England. It is very important. He's talking about the training of the eye. Indeed, when you are a paleographer, the first thing you need to learn is to look at the manuscript in a very specific way. You need to develop a series of questions that you ask the manuscript so that the manuscript can answer you back. If you come, if you open a manuscript unarmed in a way, without a series of questions that you are going to ask to the manuscript, the manuscript will not talk back to you. It will remain mute. It will not give you the answers you are looking for. So it's very important indeed to train your eye to be able to observe very specific elements in the manuscript, to discern pertinent features, not just every, every feature. Every person who works on manuscripts knows how, um, how diverse a manuscript book is, how many differences, even in the shape of the same letter, even by the same scribe on the same page, on the same line we find. Are all these elements pertinent? Are all these elements important to differentiate between chronological and historical context of the manuscript? So some of these features will be interesting to recognize the scribe, scribe scribe's cognitive state or physical state, a shaky Aleph because he was tired or, um, or unclear outlines of the letter because it, it was dark. And in the Middle Ages, when it is dark, it's very difficult to write because there is no electric light. So obviously, um, obviously you, you use, either you don't write when it is dark or you use candlelight, which changes your perception of the page as described. So you can follow differences in the letters and think about the scribe and how he worked. And you can sometimes see that he was tired or ill or, uh, or unhappy in his very difficult physical work. Mm, but, uh, but not all these small differences of the letters will be pertinent for the letters typology. That means for the attribution of, of specific shapes of the letters and then the script and the manuscripts to a certain type. Uh, some other scholars consider, on the contrary, such as Solomon Birnbaum, he, who is the only person who published um, a, a collection of comprehensive collection of Hebrew script samples uh, in 1957 and the second volume, 1971. Uh, Solomon Birnbaum 
considered that script can be measured and that the typology of the Hebrew script uh, is actually a sum of different measurements. It's a mathematical science. So he said, in investigating the development of script, the forms of the letters have to be examined in the greatest possible detail. This is to be done, so to speak, by means of measuring. That is the basic method of paleography. For instance, in giving a description of a cursive, what we are really doing is to enumerate a series of measurements. By working out a comprehensive system of such measurements, letter by letter and age by age, it is possible to build an unsoluble basis for establishing order out of chaos and for arranging the letter form of the Hebrew script, about 100,000 of them, according to my rough estimate, into regional, functional, and chronological groups. Well, he's talking about measurements. He's talking about rough estimate, because this kind of measurement, 100,000 elements estimated, of course, he couldn't have done them in 1957. Uh, the computers can do it. The computers can measure the letters, but can but are measures really relevant for the typology of the Hebrew script? What do the measures do? If you measure the letters, is it about the size of the letters? Can't the same scribe make different, not only uh, shapes, but also sizes of the letter, different proportion of them? How relevant the measurements are and what kind of measurements, if any, are important for paleographical typology. So these are a few elements that we have to take into consideration and the different approaches to, to the paleography as such and to Hebrew paleography in particular when we um, deal with paleographical methods and with the aims of paleography. What does the paleography do? Why do we study? paleography, the study of the, of the script. One of the reasons is that we want to read easier. The manuscripts which are very difficult to read, but difficult to read, it, it can be for different, different reasons. It can be objective, like on this Geniza fragment of a palimpsest that you can see here, not only the manuscript was written in such a way that uh, Greek and Hebrew texts overlap and cross, making reading much more difficult, but also the manuscript has been eaten by mice and destroyed. So, um, so it is very difficult to read it because simply some of the parts of the manuscript don't exist. Here, the paleography can help a little bit, but not too much. We need other means in order to decipher these kind of texts. However, there are as well subjective problems in reading manuscripts such as script or handwriting uh, differences. Differences according to our training. When we read Hebrew today, we are all trained to read Israeli Hebrew, printed Hebrew, which was based since the 16th century on the Sephardi square script of the Bibles. This is the square Israeli script that we are reading today. The fonts have a model. This, this model comes from Sephardi world. This is why we are used to certain forms of letters and we are lost when we see forms of the letters we are, which are different. But when they are, if they are dif difficult for us to read today, it doesn't mean that they were so for people in their time. So when people wrote in a specific type or genre or style of Hebrew script, this is because the readers were familiar with that <clears throat> and because there was an audience for this kind of script. So, and in this case, paleography and its method can help very much because the paleography can guide the student to learn and discern specific features of different script and to train your eye in order to be able to read it. So there is the question of decipherment, which is the first element of paleography. You can study the technological and cognitive aspects of the work of individual scribes, as I have told you. You can identify whether the same manuscript, whether two different manuscripts were written by 
one or two different people, or on the contrary, how many scribes participated in the, in the writing of one manuscript. Here you make a difference between hand, handwriting of an individual person and the script as a typological um, entity. Of course, today studying paleography contributes to the very fashionable uh, discipline of manuscript study. Uh, it's very difficult to talk about the transmission of texts through time, about history of literacy, about, about materiality of the books without being able to date the manuscripts which do not contain an explicit date written by the scribe. This is why it's important for history of books and text to situate the manuscripts in time. And today, paleography is still the most reliable, non-destructive method of dating manuscripts. Of course, you can always think about C14 method as the way of dating manuscripts. However, this is a destructive method. And although today there is progress, you don't need half the manuscript to obtain your date, you still need a large sample because manuscripts are preserved in, in a context which was open to light and open to contact with, with humans, with other books. This is why the sample for C14, if you take a tiny little sample from, from, from the edge of the manuscript, is not sufficient to obtain a date because the sample is not pure. It's not like archeologists getting carbon-14 um, samples for carbon-14 out of an archeological excavation where, when the, where the, uh, the objects containing carbon were hidden from the light for, for, for centuries. We are in a very different, different situation. So in order to date in, in, a, in a, a logical and, and acceptable brackets, the samples need to be quite large. And for some manuscripts like Geniza fragments that you can see here, it's completely impossible. And then it's not the policy of libraries to cut out chunks of manuscripts to send them for dating. This is why paleography actually is still the, 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 the way you date and locate the manuscript without, without harming them. So this is a non-destructive method. And this is why it is, it is worth worth working on paleography, even if every so often we hear about new breakthrough scientific methods, but these methods do not, except for C14, do not allow for an objective um, uh, experimental um, dating of manuscript. So actually, uh, we learn about paleography in order to date and localize the manuscript, but there are many basic difficulties with uh, paleographical dating uh, of Hebrew manuscripts. First of all, paleography is the art of comparison. You compare a manuscript that you don't know with a sample which is known. Known that means it contains a date and a place written by the scribe, which informs us precisely where the manuscript and when the manuscript was written. So you take a manuscript which is dated, and then you compare to it the manuscript that you want to date. Fine, but the problem is that the state of our corpus of Hebrew manuscript is very difficult to do that because we have only about 3,500 uh, 3, manuscripts which contain a date written in the colophon by the scribe, and even less of this manuscript, just a small portion of those Contain, um, contain the place where they were written. So the state of the corpus is such that the large majority of Hebrew manuscripts, medieval manuscripts are undated. We think that we have today about 80,000 manuscripts, codices. We have Torah scrolls which have not been um, uh, counted. We have 350,000 um, Frag fragments from the Cairo Geniza across 72 different collections across the world. And we have about 20,000 fragments coming from the bindings um, of books uh, recycled in bindings of the books in Europe. And these are 
uh, discovered today in about 450 collections across the world. Uh, so we have a, a, a relatively large corpus of manuscripts, most of it fragmentary, and a large, large part of it undated. We have a small sample of manuscripts which can be used as comparison. There is as well, as well the state of our discipline, as I have mentioned, despite the wonderful work of the Hebrew Paleography Project, which was founded in 1960 by Colette Sirat in France, Malachi Betarier in uh, Jerusalem. And despite the wonderful work of the team, uh, we still are at the beginning of, of Hebrew Paleography as a full-fledged discipline, mostly because the Hebrew Paleography Project focused on what was absolutely necessary on Hebrew codicology. That means the material aspects of the construction of the book, not necessarily on the script which is used in the book. So paleography was, was left a little bit aside in the project uh, because the first elements to be described and the elements which could be quantified, described in a, in a statistic way, were uh, codicological elements. It must be said that in 1960s, when Colette Sirat and Malachi Betarier were working on the creation of this new discipline, well, of course, in the 19th century, Maurice Steinschneider has already spoken and written about, uh, about the kunde of Hebrew manuscripts, about this uh, art or science, again, kunde in German is a very different, difficult term, of Hebrew manuscripts. He actually was the pioneer of Hebrew codicology, but it must be said that scientifically speaking, as a, as a scientific discipline, codicology was created in the 50s and 60s in France and Belgium. And when Colette Sirat and Malachi Betarier um, started the Hebrew Paleography project, codicology was, was, was this very fashionable discipline which was being created. So today we are really lucky because Hebrew codicology is very well developed with a very specific database, which is called Svardata, that you can consult in English or in Hebrew, which is a wonderful database of the codicological features, the parchment, paper, uh, composition of choirs, colophons, inscriptions, and so on and so forth, of about 3,500 Hebrew manuscripts, which contain the colophon of the scribes. So this is our starting point. Codicology is extremely important because when we study the manuscripts, we of course have to study them from several points of view, but we study the manuscripts from the point of view of the materiality of the text that they carry before we move to the paleography. So paleography, although I will talk about paleography, in priority, paleography is just one component of the entire manuscript that has to be considered as a whole, as a complex machine, to quote Ezio Ornato, one of the leading codicologists of the Latin world. So what we have, what we have as the main achievement of the French-Israeli Hebrew paleography project and the wonderful work on codicology is the the broad definition of six large geocultural zones, which is Oriental, Sephardi, Yemenite, Byzantine, Italian, and Ashkenazi, and the definition of three modes of script, which are attested in different proportions and ways across these different uh, zones, square, semi-square, or what I prefer to call non-square, and cursive. So this is what we have in a way, this is the achievement of the Hebrew paleography project so far, extremely important. However, when you work on, on Hebrew paleography codicology, you realize that these typological definitions are not sufficient. But when we talk about Ashkenazi world, for instance, we talk about a very large part of the medieval Jewish world, Jewish communities, which, uh, which, uh, which includes uh, England, um, France, north of Italy, Central Europe, 
and from the 13th century onwards, Eastern Europe as well. So we have, well, of course, even earlier Eastern Europe, but we don't have manuscripts before the 13th century from Eastern Europe. So we have this enormous um, geographical span, uh, which probably, not probably, certainly elaborated, so the Jewish communities in these places elaborated different ways of writing. So although we are going to differentiate very easily Ashkenazi scripts, can we talk about smaller divisions that say differentiate between manuscripts that were written in France as opposed to the manuscripts written in Germany? And then Germany, uh, it, it is also a huge country. Can we make a difference between manuscripts written, for instance, in the eastern part, such as Regensburg, and manuscripts written on the western um, side of Germany, for instance, in the Rhine region. Can we do it, paleographically speaking? There are different ways to combine paleography with texts. For instance, the study of Marzorim is very interesting because sometimes the text reflects some local liturgical um, elements or contains notes containing liturgy in specific places. It can help our burgeoning interest in local paleography, not just Ashkenazi. We look at these two manuscripts and we see immediately that they are both Ashkenazi and both from the 13th century. But is it really sufficient? Uh, we have here one of the manuscripts, it's the Amsterdam Marzor one of the most interesting, beautifully decorated uh, liturgical manuscript, which, um, which, um, um, which was interpreted in many, many different ways. Uh, for Norman Gold, uh, it was a French manuscript. He even identified the scribe as a certain Kresbiach Nagdan from Rouen. Well, this is not the case. Uh, art historians identified the uh, graphic elements of the manuscript as typical for the Rhineland region and also the region of Cologne. Today, the scholars working on the right of this manuscript, liturgical right, confirm that this manuscript must be from Cologne. Some scholars, such, such as Epi Shoham, date this manuscript to 1260s, not from the point of view of paleography, but because he claims that he was able to identify through decoration uh, the patron of the manuscript, um, who was a very prominent Jewish, uh, Jewish um, uh, uh, wealthy uh, person from Cologne. And he was active in the middle of the, of the 13th century. So we have all these considerations which are historical, which are liturgic, textual, but can paleography help us? In order to answer this question, it's very difficult, again, because we have two manuscripts which are, in fact, quite similar. They were written, of course, by completely different scribes. But we can see, when you look at them without specifying, you can, even if you don't know Hebrew, you can see differences. Differences which go beyond the differences of the hand scribe. So I'm not going to go through these differences now, but I'd like just to tell you that one of the aims of a very specific new digitally supported paleography project would be to be able to uh, register these specific typological differences on a local level in order to retrieve them when we need them. So for the time being, it's very difficult still to say, well, what is the specific place in Germany for these two German manuscripts? But maybe at the end of our path in a few years time, we'll be able to have enough material to, to be able to do it. So as I said, of course, when you talk about paleography, you have to take into consideration the entire book, the entire codex, with its decoration, materials, and text. However, then you can move on to paleography, which maybe is not an exact science, but it does provide a good methodological template to look at the manuscripts, 
it allows to observe these minute clues to which would otherwise go unnoticed if you are not a trained paleographer. But also it provides you a language of communication with the manuscript, but also with the students. You can explain to people what you are doing. So you need always to bear in mind that the, that the, the script changes through time, but it doesn't change like you know, in a Darwinian way as a, as a natural being, living being. It's an object which is, which is created by, by the humans. And when the script changes, there are cultural reasons for this change. Some of the reasons are, are organic. They depend on the perception of the script by a specific person. However, some of the elements of change are related to the culture, context, and education of the person who writes. So we need to bear it in mind when we move on to create a, a method. So as I, as I told you, this is, I, I have in recent, in recent months, uh, with the help of a wonderful developer in Oxford, whose name is My, uh, Michael Alloway, I have managed to put online uh, the method that I have been using without digital support until now. So this is a human paleographer method, which simply is supported now by, uh, by the computer. It's a digital method. It has been created as a, the structure itself was created as a collaborative project between Paris, Ecole Pratique de Hautes Etudes, uh, the uh, Munich, Ludwig Maximilian Université, and Oxford University. We started the project together with Ronnie Folland as a project Jewish book culture in the Islamic Aid world. And we have received the support of DFG, Arts and Humanities Research Council, and Ecole Pratique de Hautes Etudes. Um, Today, a few days ago, literally, uh, we received very exciting news about a project which is called Migration of Textual and, 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 and uh, Scribal Traditions, um, which is going to be supported by ERC Synergy, European uh, Community Grants. It is an enormous project, enormous grant, which is based on the work of four PIs. I am one of those. I am the human paleography part of the project. The other colleagues will work on the transmission, edition, and paleography from the computational point of view. So maybe when we meet in a few years time, we are going to talk about how the computers identify the Hebrew script. So this project, Start, will start next year. These are the four, um, uh, uh, the four uh, principal investigators of the project. And indeed, the project that I'm, the program that I'm, I'm presenting today will be used by, especially by Nahum Dershowitz, who works on computational paleography in order to create computational approach to Hebrew paleography. But for the time being, in the time that I think that I'm talking too much, actually, please stop me if I if I'm too long. So in the time that remains, I would like very quickly to show you how the digital platform Hebrew Paleography works. So I, I'm not going to go online to show you how it works because I'm always afraid that since we have little time that it's simply something will go wrong and, and I won't be able to do. So I have simply prepared the screenshots, but you have, the, you have here the address of Hebrew paleography. So Hebrew paleography comp, this is the, 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 uh, the, the, the link that you can use if you want to go online and look by yourself how the, how the website works. So it is very new, we have described maybe two or three manuscripts for the time being. It takes about 10 hours to describe properly every single manuscript. So I have told you about the project itself and the team. So now I would like to tell you about what the project does. So it, is, it has been conceived in order to work both on script as a type, to, 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 
to note the specific clues and elements to define the script from the point of view of typology, but also to work on handwriting or, or hand. The, the database is created in such a way that it will contain, or it already contains, the possibility of describing manuscripts, um, uh, inscriptions on stone and other, other materials, and also documents. So there are three parts to this paleographical album. And we start with the, with the idea that, uh, that, that writing on different supports and with different instruments is informative and can share the same clues, the same pertinent features, which allow to uh, define the type. So of course, when the manuscript is written with a chisel, <clears throat> with a calamus or with a, or with a feather, there are, of course, differences, but there are well similarities within the same cultural zone. This is why our, uh, our uh, project concerns everything. So the Hebrew writing from the medieval period, although it can go beyond. When we describe the manuscript, we describe very different elements of the manuscript. So, of course, because, as I said, the manuscript has to be studied as a whole. Every single manuscript is described in detail, also from the point of view of codicology, the composition of the manuscript, writing material, and so on and so forth. But then we move on to describe different graphic elements of the manuscript. The graphic elements, you have the list here. I hope that you can see it, right? These are the graphic elements, right? So letters are only one of the elements that you can describe using our database. So the database functions in a very simple way. First, you get in touch with the library, very important. And you get a very good quality image of the page or pages of a manuscript you would like to use as a sample for paleographical description. So it's your choice. You ask for permission to use this manuscript and you quote copyrights for every single sample. This is very important. Then you download the manuscript into your program and you can begin to annotate the image by defining. So you annotate, you simply use your, your mouse and you underline the elements that you describe and then you go to the menus of descriptions, which are organized hierarchically in such a way that, for instance, when you describe a letter, if your letter is an aleph, you define whether it's a square or non-square aleph. And then if it is square, you will describe the letter element by um, element by element. So every single part of the letter will have the component of the letter will have a menu of features from which you are going to choose the description which fits the letter that you have underlined in such a way because it's hierarchical. So if you describe your Aleph and if you describe, for instance, just the, the, the right hand branch of the Aleph, the features of this element which appear in the menu automatically when you have pressed Aleph right hand branch, the features will be limited only to the features which can apply to this particular component. So you don't need to think as you, when you learn about paleography, ah, does it apply to Aleph? Yes, everything which will come out on your screen as a menu to choose the elements of description will apply to this particular component only, which allows people who are not yet trained paleographers to describe correctly and to observe correctly and to use the menus, not only to describe the letters, but also to learn how to describe the letters. So in a way, the method is interactive because you have a limited amount of, um, of features which are organized hierarchically and the features of description correspond precisely 
to the part of a specific letter that you are describing. So that helps you simply to learn about how to describe it. This is why I am using this, uh, this platform not only to create the album for the others to, to look and check and to refer to, but also for the students to learn how to describe uh, letters or other elements. So the elements, you can see them here. We describe separately abbreviations, decoration, every single element can be described, cut out to create a gallery of images and described specifically. Divine symbols, you know how many, how the name of God is written, ligatures, justification at the end of the line, what are the forms that symbols that the scribes use to, to fill the lines which are too short, or on the contrary, to shorten the lines which are too long to keep to justify the left-hand margin. Magical characters, which are frequent, the Meshuna modified characters, which are frequent in Torah scrolls, but also in many Ashkenazi codices, Bible codices, letters which are modified according to a mystical tradition and which have their own paleographical tradition, punctuation of manuscript, dots, little circles that the scribes use to separate the paragraphs, and many other graphic elements of the letters. So it is a very complete way of describing the, the, the manuscript from the graphic point of view. So as you can see here, I have given you the example of the description of the letter Lamet. We describe the ascender, just the mass of the letter Lamet, and then we have a list of features. You have multiple choice. You don't need to type the description. You just underline, you click the, the choice. You just look at the lamet and you click uh, in the list which, uh, which you find uh, on your screen. So it allows you to describe it not only precisely, but also in an identical way from one describer to another, from one letter to another. And not only that, uh, when you have once you have described the manuscript and all the features in the um, in the back office as an admin here what I am showing you is the front office this is what the readers see uh, once you have described it in the back office and once your description is validated because every single description is validated by a scientific committee so I for the time being I am looking personally at every description which has been done to make sure that it's correct. There are many people involved in the project. Um, so once it is, um, it is um, accepted and published, it appears at the, front, at the front page, but also not only, so you have the description of the manuscript, but you can as well use the description. You simply click this, you simply underline, choose, select these uh, specific uh, features describing every single element of the letter. But on the front page, it creates a text which allows you, you can see it as a menu, but you can as well see it as a running text. If you, if, if you for instance, you write a PhD dissertation or a book in which a part of the book is a description of the manuscript. Once you have described it in this very consistent way on the database, you can simply, uh, you can simply um, cut paste from the website into your book and to have the, the paleographical description element by element. So there is as well a very clear application of this program for all kinds of needs. So this is more or less how it works. You simply get a manuscript, you describe it, you get specific element letter. The, the, uh, the method is based on the method that I have followed, as I said, for more than 20 years. And my own paleographical method is based on a forensic method of uh, recognition, identification of script, which was developed by Marie-Jeanne Seden, who was an, ex who was an expert in uh, in the Court of Justice in France. She worked on, um, on French, on Latin script. And I started my own method by adapting her approach to the Hebrew script. So this approach begins with codicology text. You need to know everything about the manuscript. 
And then you move on, not only to specific letters and morphology of the letters, but also to many global features of the script. The database contains the description of the global feature of the script as well. So it, all this appears and all this is uh, included into the database. And only then you move on to the description of specific smaller graphic elements, such as, for instance, letter. So here you have a letter Aleph that you will define, if you can, as let's say the type of the letter is oriental, the mode of the letter is square, the quality is calligraphic, the function is bookhand, it's used to copy books, it's a biblical manuscript, it's a book. Then you choose the component that you want to describe, for instance, left hand downstroke, which is this part, right? This is the left hand downstroke. And then you simply discuss. You have all these features that on the on the database, you will be able to choose as many as you want. For instance, here you see immediately that the left hand down, downstroke is curved with the knee. Okay. So you will underline that. Does it reach the baseline? Yes, it does reach the baseline. Does it have the foot? Yes, it does have a foot, right? So you can indeed define these several elements. And then it has the foot. Another element of the description of the Aleph will be the foot. And you will be asked whether the foot goes uh, to the left, to the right, whether it's parallel to the line, whether it's lifted, whether it's slanted, and so on and so forth. So you have a very, very precise description, which this is, this is just an example of how the back office looks like. You create a new image, you download a new item, you download an image, you describe the hands, and you add new letter or other uh, graphic elements component. You can search this database in many, many different ways. There are almost as many filters as there are menus. And I must tell you that the menus, the description of all these elements, before they were put online, they were about 110 pages of a Word A4 format of questions, checklists. So it was an enormous checklist, which can be used only if it is organized hierarchically, so that when you go, indeed, when you describe one feature of the letter, you don't have more than that amount of features in order to work on it. Otherwise, you will be lost if you have pages and pages of checklist elements to choose from. So you are guided in the choice as the, as the person who describes the manuscript. So you have all these different elements, and then you can go on the main page of the database, you can click on a specific, you know, you can choose, select a specific manuscript or, and you can see whatever we have done with this manuscript, but you can, you can as well search our database. There are two basic ways of searching. So you can either search by a Google like search, just typing the words and what you are looking for, or you can search by filters or combine the free text with filters. And the filters are many. So you can search not only through, let's say, I want to see all the manuscripts which were written in the 13th century in Germany or Ashkenazi manuscripts or whatever. So you can select these filters and, and run the search. But you can be much more detailed. You can say, please show me all the letters Aleph, which are Oriental, which are from the 11th century and which have a foot on the left hand downstroke going to the right. And then you will have the gallery of all the letters Aleph, that for the time being is difficult to show you because we have introduced not enough manuscripts, but this is basically how it works. So you can, you get the gallery of all the Alephs, and from every single Aleph in your gallery of Alephs that you have recalled, you can go back by selecting it to the manuscript and obtain the gallery of the other shapes, other letters, other elements in this particular manuscript. 
And you can as well, through going back to items, you, you can as well see the description of the manuscript as an object. So not only the elements, but also everything, including the bibliography about the manuscript. So you have indeed a very complete way of looking not only for manuscripts, but also for very specific features. So here you have a description, for instance, of this letter Aleph. So this is what is happening. You can, you can select a letter. You can open an entire image from the selected letter when you have searched. You can go back to the main page, or you can see the description, very detailed description of this particular letter. Here it is. You have the features of the main oblique stroke, which is this part of the letter, followed by left hand down stroke, this part of the letter, you have it here, right? And then right arm, okay, this is the right arm. Then you have the roof on the right arm, which is, which is described in detail. And then finally, you have the foot on the left, right? Which is this part. So every single feature is described according to the part of the letter and can be recalled, can be retrieved through, through the search. So the, the aim, and here I think that I have to conclude, the aim is through these menus, very detailed menus, to be able at the end to identify a few pertinent features which will allow us to say, for instance, these are two oriental manuscripts. These two, these are two oriental letter alephs. These are two oriental alephs in the square calligraphic script, right? Same type, same quality, same mode, square. But they are not the same. Look at that. They don't look the same. You see it immediately. Why don't they look the same? Well, here you need a paleographer to explain to you why. They don't look the same, mostly because the, there are several, let's say there are maybe seven different features, but the most prominent one that you see immediately is the fact that the left hand downstroke down of this Aleph descends, does not descend from the top, from the headline. That means the imaginary line which um, which encloses the letter from the top, but at some distance from this line, okay? It starts somewhere here. Whereas here, the left hand downstroke starts at the top, at the headline, this is the headline, right? So, so here, the left hand downstroke goes straight as a straight line to the baseline, whereas here, it descends to the baseline with a knee. It's curved. The foot of this aleph goes towards the left, whereas the foot of this aleph goes up and towards the right in the middle of the letter. I have given you just a very limited amount of features. I have described this letter using a few pertinent features. And now, when I have a lot of these features, I will be claiming, after my experience and looking at many manuscripts, that the Aleph, which is on our left, this one, is the Oriental Aleph of the Northeast time, type or Babylonian type, whereas this one is of Palestinian type. It doesn't mean that so Palestinian type, that's the Aleph which is used well, mostly attested in, in, in the Cairo Geniza, which is used in Palestinian text and some Egyptian text. The, the Babylonian type, it does not mean that the manuscripts in the Babylonian type were all written in Iraq or Iran in Babylonia, because the Babylonian script was the ideal of calligraphy and spread across Jewish diaspora and influenced other types across Europe. However, even if it doesn't tell us that a specific manuscript was created in Iraq or Iran, it is essential to define precisely what subtype 
of the Orienta script is, it represents. It already gives us a very important information. To add to all these other elements, the text and parchment and paper and ink and so on and so forth, and history of the manuscript, which will tell us about where the manuscript comes from. But identifying the script is a very important element, which does help. It does give us a certain percentage of arguments in the history of the manuscript. It is also important because Oriental script was this first model for all the diaspora scripts that developed in the diaspora. But through identifying specific graphic elements, we can follow the development of the scripts in Europe, which follow certain cultural and economic paths of distribution of the models. For instance, we find shapes which contain similar characteristics to the ones that I have defined for the Babylonian Oriental script, which were inherited by the Sephardi scripts. That you can differentiate very easily from Oriental script, but you can see that Sephardi script is a daughter or son or whatever family descendant from the, this type of Oriental script. Whereas Italian scripts, we know that there were so close, such close, so close contact between southeastern Italy and the land of Israel, this type of script actually contains very similar characteristics to the 11th and 12th century script that developed in Italy. And we can, we can go even find even finer um, definition. Here I was giving, I was comparing two manuscripts, Valmadonna I and uh, Bibliotheque Nationale Hebrew 113. I compared these two, two manuscripts because many scholars thought that they were written by the same person uh, through specific paleographical features, I was able to determine not only that they were not written by the same person, but that the manuscript 113, it's later by several dozens of years, uh, from then the manuscript Balmadonna I, which is today in Washington Bible Museum, which was before that in London, and even before that belonged to Sassoon Collection, and which is a very important manuscript. It's explicitly dated to 1189 and contains a list of um, impure birds from Leviticus uh, on one of its margin, which is written in Anglo-Norman French. Well, Northern French, one word is attested in only Anglo-Norman. So we think that the manuscript also from codicological point of view is Norman or English. This is why this manuscript is so important. So looking at the two manuscripts and making a very long paleographical checklist analysis of them, I came to the conclusion that there are just three features which differentiate these, these two scripts completely. Both are Ashkenazi, both are calligraphic, both are from Normandy or England or Northern France. So not only Ashkenazi, but from this particular part of the world, but they have differences. One of them, is the presence of the drop in the, um, in the vertical downstrokes of the letters, which is not, which is not attested here, or it's much, much less strong. Look at the mem, the drop shape, and no drop here, right? There is as well a much stronger bifurcation of fish tails of the, of the um, horizontal strokes, in this manuscript. In this manuscript, the letter Lamed is very, very short. Here, it comes to the baseline. There are more features, more differences, but already with these three differences, we can say that, first of all, it's not the same scribe, but more importantly, that this manuscript is already written in the 13th century, because these are Gothic features which developed in the 13th century rather than in the 12th century manuscript. So you can date it. So for the time being, we don't have handbooks or lists of features for Hebrew paleography, unlike Arabic or, or especially Latin paleography, but we are getting there through this very specific description and study of the manuscripts. So this is exactly what the digital database will do. It will provide us 
with the description of several thousand manuscripts, it will provide us with very reliable arguments, clues in limited numbers, which will allow us and those who study manuscripts which are not on our database to define precisely why this manuscript is oriental and why this manuscript is Sephardi, for instance, they are very similar in a way. And why this manuscript, this Alep, is an Ashkenazi Alep. So, and then also to provide a much finer typology according to smaller geographical zones in these large Ashkenazi, Sephardi, or Oriental uh, zones. Thank you very much. I'm sure that I was too long. And if you have questions, I'll be very happy to answer them. I will maybe stop sharing. What do you think? Like this, I will see you. Sure. Th yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Judith, for this wonderful uh, discussion. And, and uh, I think for those of us who are not specialists in Hebrew paleography, you know, a very important uh, primer and, and uh, insight into this project. Um, we have an opportunity for some questions, uh, either uh, through the chat or if uh, people want to raise their hand, um, we can call on you if you want to ask the question directly. I had a couple of questions that came to my mind just to start off. Um, I mean, this is, uh, it, it's really extraordinary and it's kind of, um, it seems very exciting as you described, you know, that uh, an exciting moment in in Hebrew paleography because of course in, in up for other, for, for Arabic and for Latin uh, Roman scripts, I mean, you, you know, there are sort of long standing methods for describing letter forms, but maybe some of them have fallen out of use or very few people know how to apply them today or define them properly. But I was wondering, um, well, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, if the the kind of data that you obtain from these descriptions is um, in some cases sufficient enough uh, to define a, in, a particular individual scribe. I mean, is, is it um, so granular that um, you know, you could eventually use this system to sort of match up, I mean, not just localities, but like individual scribes. Um, so that that's one question. And then the other question is sort of how does it, how do you handle this sort of uh, more, as you mentioned at the beginning, the more artistic, the more intuitive aspects like ductus and, mm -hmm. um, you know, perhaps other aspects that are difficult to uh certainly to, to quantify or even to qualify with specific terms. Yes, thank you very much for the two questions. So uh, first of all, yes, uh, the method that I was using, just human method that I was teaching was based on the handwriting identification method. I moved on typology from the handwriting. And actually I have realized that you can ask the same questions to obtain different different answers. So the method was my own method is not based on measurements. Maybe you have you have already realized that I don't measure the letters. I don't care how large. Well, it's very important to know. We do have one question which says, you know, around two millimeters or around five millimeters, because it does give you an idea about what you see. But I don't my method is not based on very precise, you know, measurements. Uh, you know, to zero, one, 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 three points that the computer can do, but it doesn't help me because, you know, the scribe does not measure the letters when he writes, why I should measure them. So, but what is important is that the method that, so it's not a measurement. So I am giving lists of a checklist, but it is not a statistical checklist. It doesn't mean that if you answer in 70% of cases, yes, to a question that this manuscript has to be qualified in one way or another. This is not about mathematics and statistics. It is about guiding your eye, your observation. And this is how I cope your second question with this, um, uh, with this uh, uh, um, very um, intuitive aspect. It's not intuition. It is a certain knowledge that human human brain can do it. I think that for the computers, that's what we are going to see at the end of our project, 
how well the computer can imitate us, maybe. But paleography, it's really, you know, we all differentiate. We, we see handwriting of a person, we know we recognize it immediately. Every human being has this capacity of differentiating handwriting scripts and so on and so forth. We are very good at that. At that. The problem is it's very difficult to explain how we do it and what is happening. So th this is why I have started with Montague wrote James, who says, oh, this is an intuition. Just look at the manuscripts. And at some point, you know. But what does it mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You actually function like Sherlock Holmes. You function by clues. You need to identify them. You know, this idea of clue was very much, you know, used in, uh, in art history. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't mean that it's pure intuition. You simply need to identify and your brain does it. This is how we work. We identify these little elements even when we don't think about it. So the, diffic the difficulty is not really to identify the clues, but to realize that we do it and to name them. So my method is about naming the clues. They are there and we see them. So we need to name them and try to find a way of using them in a meaningful way. I always, with my students, I always quote Sherlock Holmes. I always do it. So I will do it again. Although sometimes you probably, some of you have heard it. So I apologize for it. You have Sherlock Holmes, Dr. Watson. A man comes and then Sherlock Holmes, they discuss, the man goes away. And Sherlock Holmes says, okay, so there is this one is so-and-so and he has just come back from uh, from China and his his wife doesn't love him, right? So then uh, uh, Watson says, "Well, that's magic. How are you doing it?" And then and then Sherlock Holmes explains. It's very easy. He has a stain on the finger, which is the stain made by the ink, which does not exist in England, which is taken from China. Okay. And then he says, and his life, his wife doesn't love him because he has a top hat, and the top hat was not lovingly brushed. So whatever clues you say, he's not inventing anything. He's simply interpreting what he sees. And this is what we need to do. So everything is in the manuscript. We don't need anything else. If the manuscript is written in a clear way that we can see the elements, we can see the writing, well, it's up to us. So, so the clues are there. We just need to find them. It's like a game. And the method that, that I have introduced allows us to see the clues both for handwriting and for script. These are basically the same clues. Only some of them are used to find differences. Spot the difference, okay? The other ones are used on the contrary to find similarities. So despite the difference, so, so once you have spot, spotted the difference, now you have to, this is more difficult. Spot the difference is easy. Actually, to identify the hand is much easier than to explain the proper typology of the manuscript. Spot the difference is to define the scribe, the hand, whether two things were written by the same person or not. And then you look for similarities to say, aha, all these different people learned from the same teacher, worked in the same place worked in the same century. Well, if you can't make teacher, at least you will make century and place, okay? This is easy, this you can make. Teacher is maybe more difficult, but you try to find people belonging to the same group, but the clues are the same. They are all written in the manuscript. The point is to find them. And in order to find them, I have written the checklist. So you can follow the checklist to find the clues. Maybe some scholars, my students and others, will find other clues and I'll be very happy to hear about it and introduce them into my own description. But for the time being, we have uh, this, uh, this list of, of one, 100, more than 100 pages of clues who guide us. Yes, yes, Miri, maybe community practice as well. And I see as well a question from Rebecca. Uh, yes, Rebecca, it does cope with, um, with manuscripts, codices, scrolls, rotuli, but also with documents, of course. Um, I don't know, have I answered Nicola? Nicola, yeah, have I answered? No, that, absolutely. I mean, I, 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 mean, I, I, I think I, I agree absolutely with what you're saying. I, I was wondering about sort of 
I guess, um, uh, you know, aspects of script that go beyond the sort of graph theme, like how you deal with sort of, yeah. the, you know, ductus or things or, or yeah. kind of interrelations beyond the letter form and how yeah. you account for that specifically, like what, what nomenclature you, you, you know, what, what, what language you've invented yeah. because as it seems, you know, many of these, you know, things have, have, have been, uh, again, understood, but not, not voiced by paleographers sufficiently in an yeah. orderly manner. So how, so how do you, how have you kind of described these sort of yeah. the more difficult yeah. elements, the more intangible elements? How have you specifically described them? Or can you give yes. us an example? I should have, of course, I knew that you were going to be in the audience. I should have prepared the slide that I haven't done which shows the, what I have mentioned, the global approach to the script. So the, the, the paleographical method is done on two levels. The, the one that I have described, because I could show it very easily and, you know, and, uh, and, and it's kind of appealing, is the description of every single graphic element. But the morphology, basically, that's the morphology of the script. And you, as you, you know a lot about the manuscript, and you know very well that that's not enough. On the contrary, in a proper paleography method, that's the last element that you go to. That's this kind of, you know, when you begin the paleography, you say, wow, this Aleph is different from the other. That's actually not relevant, not so much. What is relevant, it's a much more, as you say, intuitive and global vision of the script, which includes the ductus. So yes, so in, in this, in this um, database, there is an entire enormous checklist to describe as well these elements, which are not, which are not the morphology of specific letters. They include proportions of the letters, mm. the ductus of the letters, the rapidity of the script, which can be defined. So when I say rapidity, I don't expect the students to say, oh, this one is written fast, and this one is not written fast. There is a definition of what is fast. And this, I think that uh, with Lynn, when, when, when I was invited here, I was talking about it. What is the rapidity of the script? What does it mean that the script is quick? What does it mean that the script is cursive? And actually you can define it in just a few elements because you don't know, you are not here. You can't see how the scribe writes. Although we, I do have a wonderful doctoral student, Jen Taylor, who is a soferet, who is a professional, professional uh, scribe of, uh, of manuscript. And on the same database, Hebrew PAL, if you go to the part which is called help, you are going to have films which were made by Jen of writing. So actually you reconstruct the movements, historical movements, but that's another matter. So she can tell whether it's fast or not, but you can define even watching the, the, the manuscript what does it mean that it's quick? So you, you, you can immediately see how many, of course, the ductus, how many strokes were used to trace one letter, the number of ligatures, of course, but there are other elements such as reduction of horizontal elements. When you write horizontal line and when you write a vertical line, the vertical is much easier and quicker. So in quick script, you reduce completely the horizontality. Everything becomes vertical because it's quicker. And although quicker, it's just a fraction of a second. But when you copy so many characters by hand, the fraction of a second builds up to days of scribe's work at the end. So there is as well the use of uh, rounded rather than you know uh, straight angles and so on and so forth. So you can define it. And on this database, there are these definitions. So you define the script. You say whether it's quick, whether it's not. The density is very important. Density is important also for the time of writing when you don't space the letters. Of course, you, you write quicker, but also for, for, from type, typology point of view, because some types of the letters have different spacing and relationship between the letters. So global approach is about relationship between the letters among them, between the letter and the, and the line of writing, headline and baseline, between the elements within the letter, how they connect. And from, from the page to the line, to the words, to the letter and elements of the letter, this is how this method goes. You start by manuscript, then there is page. 
and then you go slower, slower, you know, you, you reduce your description to specific features of specific elements. But what I have shown you today is the features of the element. But we have as well all these menus that I have written for the global description, which is what you call this more intuitive proportions, relationship, angles, uh, you know, how, how letters relate to each other. It's not the same. The scribe, sometimes you can say calligrapher, he makes an enormous effort. For instance, when he writes a lament which goes above the line, not to get into the letter above. So sometimes he will, he will make it lean a little bit just to make sure that it doesn't touch the letter above. So there are all kinds of elements which you have to follow the scribe as well, stroke by stroke, gesture by gesture. So it's not just about the, you know, the script, how it looks like in, in its static form. That's one of, way, of the ways we look at the script, but there is as well this very dynamic uh, way uh, where you follow the scribe and his problems and his difficulties. And, and here there is, you know, there is a stain and what he's going to do and how he's going to go around and so on and so forth. So these, these are very important elements. And this is this global part of the project, which exists, I should have made, made it. No, you thank know, you. This a slide is very, of it, but I, I did <laughs> But edifying. it exists. Yeah. We have a question about um, uh, how, how, the, um, how this uh, tool treats glosses. And, and, you know, related to that, I, had a, I was wondering about that. I mean, how uh, you deal with, you know, different hands potentially and, you know, different portions of, a, uh, you know, different codicological units and how you've kind of accounted for that. Yes. So very easily, because since it's not a, a computerized method, but just a digital battle, so we decide. So if on your sample, you choose a page and if on the, or you choose several pages, you can, you can attach. First of all, this is the structure of the, of the description. There is absolutely no problem. You can describe as many hands per manuscript as you want. Wait, I will maybe share the screen and I will show you what I mean by that. It's this one, it's this one, yes. So, yeah, but now it doesn't work. Okay, wait, I will do differently. It doesn't want to move. So let's open like that and Let's see what is happening here. So, uh, so you, you can see here the back office and how we describe the, the manuscripts. So first of all, you describe your item. This is your, um, paleo, uh, this is your library unit, your item. The manuscript on the bookshelf with a shelf mark. This is the item or a inscription or a document, whatever. And you are going to define it very precisely. If there are several codicological units, you are going to say. So for you, the item will be divided into different codicological units or paleographical units, which is not the same, different hands. What we are interested in basically uh, paleographical units. We are not going to describe codicological units. We will just say in the description that it has so many codicological units and so many um, choirs and so on and so forth. What we are going to spot is different paleographical units. If in one manuscript you have three different scribes, we are going to use at least three different samples. So when you go to item images and you add, you can add you relate to the same item as many images as you want. Mm -hmm. So you can have five, 10 different images or the entire manuscript if you want. So you add images and you describe every image separately. And then you describe the hands on every image. So on every image, you might have one or more hands. So if you have glosses or if you have just the change of the principal scribe, it doesn't make any difference. You just describe every hand separately. And then from the hand, you go to the letter components and features or to other elements, graphic elements, components, and features. So it doesn't make any difference how many hands you have. Every single item can attach as many hands as necessary because it's, it's hierarchical. 
because it's structured in such a way and because a wonderful developer worked on the program. Wonderful. Um, we should wrap up in a minute or two, but uh, we have one last question from uh, Miri Rubin about uh, the role of the philologist in the ERC project. Yes. Um, yes. So the, so Miri, I don't know whether you saw this project already. It's very new. It was announced on the 25th or we are on the 28th. So it's very, very fresh. But of course, it was in preparation for uh, for many, many years because one of these synergy projects and indeed, so there are philologists working with with uh, computer scientists. So there is one complete philologist, me, because I don't know about the computers. I use them like I use washing machines, but uh, machines, but I uh, but I don't know about programming the, the computers and writing algorithms. I just use them. So there is one pure philologist. There is one mathematician and, and the author of algorithms, that's Professor Nahum Deshovitz from Tel Aviv University. And there are two human, digital humanities specialists, that's Avi Schmidman and Daniel Steckel Benezra, who both work on philology, on texts, on manuscripts, but also are able to write algorithms. So the program as such, and here I'm not talking only about paleography, I'm making the publicity for this new project, okay? So the program is an extremely, an extremely ambitious program, which includes paleography. That's what I am going to be involved with, but also a completely different aspect, which is text history and text edition. So there are two elements in addition to paleography and paleography helps with that, of course. So we work together but there is an element of an automatic transcription of manuscripts. That's Escriptorium of Daniel Stecker Benezra. So he goes to the, you know, to, to, to a collection of, of images and through an algorithm, an entire manuscript is, is transcribed in no time at all. And you as a scholar, you simply go back to your screen and you see the line of the text and the line of transcription, and you correct it letter by letter, which means that you work much, much quicker. So that's one element. So normally, if you have good images and the access to them, through this program, you can transcribe all Hebrew manuscripts in very short time, create a library of the entire, not only text that we have already for Jewish tradition, we have, you have Barilan project, for instance, we have texts from editions, but you can edit every single manuscript. So for Bible manuscripts, square, it works beautifully. It works beautifully. The, 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 the degree of error is just one or 2%. So, you know, if you transcribe yourself, you make more errors. You have to go through it as well. For other, you know, Percy scripts, it doesn't work very well yet. But that's exactly what the project is about. And the co collaboration with paleographers to make sure that the computer is trained to, to do it much, much better. So here, you know, I'm out of my comfort zone. I'm talking about the work of my colleagues mm -hmm. because I am myself this horrible, simple philologist who is going to help with my human expertise with what they are doing with the computers. But the project is ambitious and wonderful. At the same time, there is another element to the project, and that will be mostly done uh, by uh, Avi Schmidman and his team in collaboration with Daniel Steckel and with paleographers, both me and Nahum Dershowitz as computational paleography, uh, of creating relationships between manuscripts, between texts, and between also between you know kind of intertextual um, relationships that the computer will find. So you bring a new text. Let's imagine the dream. We are five years later. We get a manuscript, which is a liturgical manuscript. Nobody has ever worked on it. We don't know what kind of manuscript it is, what kind of slichot it contains, what kind of prayers, and so on and so forth. So with what Daniel has developed, you just transcribe it in no time at all. You create the edition of this text. With what I do, will be able to say, okay, it's French from the 13th century. Uh, 
with what, what Nahum is doing, we'll be able to say, yes, it's French 13th century, and it is similar to 20 different manuscripts, right? And then with what Abi is doing, we'll be able to see, okay, this sliha appears here, but it also appears here, here, here. And this cluster of words appears in so many different manuscripts across the corpus. And the corpus, and here, this is what is very, very interesting. The project works with Ktiv, National Library of Israel. Ktiv is a partner of the project. So normally, if everything goes well, my colleagues and their computers will have the access to the entire corpus of Hebrew manuscripts. So if everything goes well, I, I won't be needed after five years as a paleographer. <laughs> the computers will do it all. <laughs> So that's the idea, basically, and um, and we are hopeful that it will work. The project is very ambitious and very beautiful, and I am very very happy to participate uh, in this project. Although my role is very limited, it's limited to paleography. That's wonderful and a wonderful way to end uh, this this great presentation, uh, Judith. Uh, so uh, virtual round of applause, and uh, we look forward to. Uh, Perhaps having you back in in five years uh, to report on uh, the uh, conclusion. Yeah, thank you very much. It was absolutely wonderful, and thank you for your attention. Thank you all, and uh, a reminder that uh, next to, to register for next month's symposium, uh, and also our December uh, our talk uh, by Federico Botana on December 9th. So thank you all for coming. Thank you. Bye.